did a lot on Tuesday for the layout. <laughs> and um, it's a lot of things to talk about because why do we need unwell and why is code unwell? And why is code a well, right? So there's so many things to talk about regarding semiconductor basics. But before we talk about unwell, so why n, right? And why it's a well? And why unwell? Mm. We'll come back to this page, and so you'll be able to answer all these questions. Make sure you, are, you guys are learning something. So why n? So before we talk about n, it's mostly represent as uh, a word negative, I believe, because silicon, you know, the, all the chips are built on silicon wafer. And the silicon, how many protons in silicon? 15, 14? How many of you have learned uh, chemistry? One, 150 or something. A little bit about chemistry. So do you know protons? Have heard about protons, Jesse? Noah? Protons? Electrons? <laughs> okay, so silicon has how many protons? 14. And so the, they are called orbits of the electrons. It has two electrons for the, I don't know if it's called the first or, you know, the inner layer of the orbit. So it has two and then eight. So how many left? How many of them left for the outer layer? Four. So this layer is also called, uh, so these, these electrons is also called the valence electrons. How many of you have heard about this concept, valence electrons? You, most of you. So they are involved uh, in chemical bonds with other items. Uh, you have to put some impurities in there. So it's called dope, doping. Yeah. You're, you're in analog? Or you are in analog now? No. Not yet. Okay. Last spring? Okay. That's four, which means the a piece of silicon, definitely there are many, I don't know how many, like billions or billions of billions of items in the piece of silicon, right? And they are formed by all these um, bonds in between all the atoms. So, for example, we just take a, a little tiny item in the middle, and you can see all the surrounding silicon atoms are sharing that single electron uh, with each other. So if you draw all the silicon items, you can keep going, right? But we only look at the one of them. For example, just pick up one and look at the four, how the four valence electrons are being shared in all the bonds, right? So for example, this silicon item has one, two, three, four valence electrons. And it's gonna share, um, it's in the form of uh, bonds with other atoms, silicon atoms surrounding it. So there's another silicon atom sharing uh, one valence electron to form a bond with this silicon atom. Same to the other ones. But however, every uh, silicon only has four valence electrons uh, forming all the bonds with other atoms. Okay, and it's stable, no problem with it. And this is called intrinsic silicon. Okay. However, we wanna make the conductivity of the material to be uh, changeable. You know, it's called semiconductor, it's not a conductor, it's not an insulator, it's a semiconductor. We wanna control the conductivity of the material, 
uh, so we can we can turn it on, turn it off, and modify the conductivity using uh, voltages. So in that case, we have to dope it with um, impurities. So there are two most popular materials. The first one is uh, phosphorus. which has 15 protons. So the orbits of electrons look like this, two, eight, five. It's a high, it has five electrons, the valence electrons inside of four, like silicon. So what's gonna happen is, if you apply a certain condition, for example, high temperature, and high pressure, there must be other conditions have to apply to it whenever you want to dope that material into the intrinsic silicon. Okay. Usually this is done in a vacuum chamber. You put an uh, intrinsic silicon, piece of silicon wafer in there, and then you dope it with, and you um, um, just release all the molecules or the atoms of uh, phosphorus into the chamber. And it's going to dope into the intrinsic silicon. So it's going to replace the silicon atoms in the uh, material. So what's going to happen is it's going to form. It's going to replace it. Have a P in the middle, and all the other silicon atoms surrounding that P, that phosphorus atom, in the middle. However. This P has five valence electrons instead of four. So when the original silicon atom in the middle has four, working nicely with other <laughs> silicon atoms. So for example, the red uh, dots are the electrons for the valence electrons of the phosphorus atom. So there's one more. It's not forming any bonds with, with um, all the silicon atoms. You know, these black dots are the silicon's valence uh, electron, so they are form forming all the bonds. But there will be one more left. Okay, so there will be more um, free electrons in the material. And this is called n-type semiconductor. So this represents negative, I think, because the electron is taking negative charges. It's n-type semiconductor. You have to dope a P material, which is confusing sometimes, of dope phosphorus, which is P, that material, into the silicon, intrinsic silicon, to make it n-type semiconductor. All right? Okay. So why n? Because the N well we used in the in electric VLSI on Tuesday is an N type semiconductor. It's a intrinsic silicon doped with phosphorus in there. Make sense? That's the material you, you have used. Um, and you didn't see uh, on the background in a in a layout tool because it's uh, by default it's uh, everyone knows. You are laying out your circuit on a p-type silicon wafer. So, for example, this is a cross-sectional view of the of your layout. So, when you are laying it out, you are looking at the wafer from the top. It's a top view, right? You are laying out the circuits. It's a top view. However, if we cut the silicon wafer like cutting a pie and looking from the side, okay, and this is a cross-sectional view. And you'll see that if you lay out, if you lay out a unwell here, it looks like this. This is the unwell. And this is the P-type uh, silicon wafer, the substrate. So what is P-type? We just talked about N-type. And now let's look at P-type really quick, and then we'll come back to the cross-sectional view of it, all right? So what is P-type? Very similar to N-type, right? If you dope it 
If you dope it with phosphorus, you're getting an n-type. I'm pointing to p, but it's the n-type, right? Because this atom has more free electrons or valence electrons available. So a, a p-type, you have to dope it with, so let's read p-type. Have to dope it with boron, which is another element on the periodic table. It's over there sometimes. If you look at the yellow one, B, I think that's boron. Right on the top corner, right corner, the B, yellow B is the boron. How many protons are in there? You can actually see it. Yeah, five. And the first orbit is still two electrons. And how many left in here? Three, okay, so it has three valence electrons to form bonds with other atoms. If you dope into the intrinsic silicon, it becomes a B here. You still have the silicon surrounding it, right? So the silicon atoms are majorities in the, in the piece of uh, material. So the silic, every silicon atom is still providing one valence uh, electron to the bonds. The boron only has three, right? So it's going to provide three valence electrons to form the bonds. And there will be one vacant uh, position. It's called a hole. There isn't really a, uh, a hole in there. It's just a, a, a vacant uh, position for to fill electron in it. You know, it just you have a um, absence of the electron. It's a hole. It can be confusing, but it's just a hole, right? It's absence of the electron. It's called a hole. So in that case, this is more. Um, it's called p-type semiconductor material. It's not contributing a uh, electron, but it's providing a hole uh, to fill an electron into it. So it's actually missing an electron. It's not really missing, but we can understand that way. It's missing an electron to fill the bond. Okay, so it's a p-type semiconductor material, and most of the cases we use the p-type silicon as the substrate. A lot of times you can see n-type. Silicon substrate as well. In probably some of uh, Dr. Jessing's labs, they use an N-type wafer instead of a P-type wafer uh, for certain purposes. But in most of the cases, for our cases, for example, when you are laying out your chip in electron VSI, you are assuming that you are laying out your circuits on a P-type substrate, but you are not seeing that P-type substrate because the entire screen is a P-type substrate. You know what I mean? We are laying out the unwell resistor. Did you see something behind it? No. It's just unwell. Because we're assuming the entire background is the p-type silicon wafer. It's a substrate. If you look at the unwell resistor from the cross-section wheel, but if you look at, for example, this is the electric VI size lay, layout wheel, right? When you are laying it out, you'll see a, you, you draw a wire here with the unwell material and has two contacts at the two terminals. So you can uh, put the metal one wire on it. So that's the top view. Top view of the layout. Right? And if this is the unwell wire, then what is this? The p-type substrate. Mm -hmm. If you cut from here, right? Cut it like a cutting a pie and looking from the side, that's a cross-sectional view of it. Okay, so this is what you are seeing. Definitely the unwell is not as deep as the, as the, the same thickness as the p-type uh, substrate. You can only see it from the cross-sectional view instead of from here, right? So you know that the unwell is only that thick or that deep. Mm -hmm. And you have one contact, another contact, and you connect the wire to it, and that forms a resistor. It's like a, 
a resistor, they have two wires going up. Make sense? That's the resistor in the chip. It looks different from the resistor on the breadboard in circuit one. It's going to look all different in, in, in the uh, chip version. So for example, in the future, we're going to lay out a capacitor. Okay, If we look at the capacitor from the top view, a cap, it looks like this. I got one material here. It's called the uh, polysilicon layer one. It has a contact here, so I can put a wire on it. I have another cap, another polysilicon material laid out is that way. And this guy has, an, has a different contact point, so I can connect wire to it. So if I cut it in the middle and look from the side, and this, again, this is still the P-type substrate, and there's a uh, silicon dioxide layer as an insulator in between all the different layers on the chip. There are so many other layers on the top, but we are not doing it. But for this one, the red one and the black one represents different layers of the, that material. It can be deposited, depo deposit uh, onto the onto the uh, wafer. So this one, if you look at the cr cross-sectional view, it looks like this. And there's no contact, I couldn't do it. But they are not contacting each other. And there's a metal contact, you can wear, put a wire on it. And there's another contact point, you can put a wire on it. Is this from the cap? So what is a capacitor? Do you still remember that from circuit one? It, it's basically a two place of metal, right? Two plates of metal and holding charges in in just on on the two plates of the metal pieces. You have uh, that electrical material in the middle, and that forms a cap. Same here. You have to have two metal plates, and they have an overlapping area, which is here. That's the effective area for the cap. What's the capacitance of the cap capacitor? Remember, C equals rho. That's a resistance. So for capacitance, it is um, distance matters, right? And area matters. If you have a larger distance, you have a smaller cap or bigger cap? Larger distance. So two metal plates, right? If they are further away from each other, each other you're getting a smaller cap or a bigger cap? Smaller cap. So D must be here, right? Bigger D, smaller cap. If you have a bigger area of the plate, do you have a bigger cap or a smaller cap? Bigger. Has more capacity, right? Right, and there's a dielectric material is constant on the top. Because the, the, these two materials are at a certain um, are being uh, fabricated on the chip during a certain process, so it couldn't control the distance between these two dielectric material. For example, I'm gonna draw it here again, make it clear to you guys. Okay, you cannot control the distance. So the D is actually a constant, mm -hmm. and because they are being fabricated with a certain material like the silicon, and these are polysilicons, it's a different material. Uh, but it cannot change it. It's a standard micro, uh, it's fabrication process. So the dielectric material constant is not being changed. Okay, if you want to lay out a different cap, the only thing you can modify here is the area. So your layout view, the top view of the layout for the cap, is to draw a bigger, draw a bigger 
area, then you're getting a bigger cap. But keep in mind, the effective area is only the overlapping area of the two metal plates. That's how you make a capacitor in the circuit. And most of the time, the capacitor takes the, the biggest area on the chip because the chip itself is tiny and you want to hold charges on the chip and there are only 2D devices so you can really not do too much to it. So that's why when we talk about pickle ferret level capacitors are reasonable uh, capacitor, capacitors in the chip. We are talking about like nanofarad. I don't believe you can put any nanofarad cap, caps on, on, on the silicon wafer. This area is too small. I think I'll give you an example on the wipe side. This operational amplifier is op-amp, op -amp, being designed with all the CMOS transistors. And you can tell, you can see that there's a little capacitor here. It's called compensating capacitor. And for the entire circuit, and the capacitor in the schematic it looks like this. But however, in the layout, Okay, so that's uh, entire op-amp. And this thing here is a capacitor. And these are all the transistors. And that's a capacitor. It takes over 70% of the area of the footprint of the layout of the op-amp. Which is this little thing here. Okay. And this is the OPAM. This is 1.5 by 1.5 millimeter silicon die as the chip layout view. And these are the bonding bonding pads. And you put this, uh, we, we sent it to Moses in 2018 and received it a few months later. Um, but they already bonded the, bonded the chip for us. But you can still see the uh, bonding, the, the dies in the lab, in the drawers of the lab in 602. Um, and you can visually tell, you know, where the bond pads are. They are 75 micrometer. It's like uh, the the size of your the diameter of your of your hair. So you can visually see it. It's a little tiny dot on the on the silicon wafer. Um, and we our wire bonder is able to bond the gold wires to this into this little hole and bond it to the pads on the chip. So these are the old pumps. You can see because that's a uh, 500 nanometer technology is pretty bad, 40 year old technology. So one op amp is taking a huge area, even though it's, it's still a microscopic level, but it's huge op amp. And this is a little inverter here, I think. So the entire chip is one point, keep in mind, it's 1.5 millimeter. It's 1.5 millimeter from, from here to here. So you can pretty much tell like the size of the little inverter the size of it. Um, okay. That's an example of the capacitor. Okay. Uh, just helping you understand the different layers. We're going to talk about more details of the layers later on. It's an important topic in this class. Um, but do you understand what's going on with the unwell and things? More details about it, okay? And well, why do we care about the dimension of it? Okay. So again, this is a cross cross sectional view of the unwell. Uh, if you just take this unwell out from this 
substrate, assuming you can do that. Okay, it looks like a rod, you know, shape like this. Like this, right? And this is the thickness. This is a T, which is here, the thickness. I cannot change it because this depends on the process technology. And can you change this, the width and the length here? Because we are laying out the resistor using the unwell material or using the unwell layer. So we are we care about the resistance, which is R equals uh, rho over the cross sectional area, the area here, right? A here, that's an A, and we know that A equals width times thickness. Rho is a resistivity. Mm -hmm. So the question is if you have a long if you have a long resistor, do you have a larger resistance or smaller resistance? Larger resistance, you have a longer one. That's why you put the resistor in serial, it's actually um, increasing the length of it, right? If you put them in parallel, it's basically changing the uh, increasing the, the cross sectional area of the resistor. So parallel resistor will reduce the resistance. Right, so for this one, this equal because we know that the thickness and the rho they are both um, constants. We're not able to change it. Uh, no times L over W. So this is the only thing we can change to modify the resistance of the unwell we laid out in the layout view. Is that correct? We cannot change these, right? They are constants. You cannot make it deeper. Depends on the process. If it's a TSMC 180 nanometer technology, it's going to be that thick. If you are doing a, T, a MOSIS uh, or the Global Foundry 500 nanometer technology, it's going to be a certain uh, thickness. They're not changing, able to change it. And the material is also constant, depending on the process. So these are the only two things you can change. To modify the resistance. Why do we want to modify the resistance? It depends on design, right? Sometimes you need a 1K resistor, sometimes you need a 10K resistor. Okay, depends on the design. In the pull up, pull down, whatever, the R2R letters for the DAC. Okay, so you do need to modify the resistance. And these are the two, two um, parameters that you can modify, right? So if you looking at it from the top view so this becomes a width this becomes the lens is that correct if you're looking at here okay this is the top view okay one quick question if you have a square a square and well for example you lay it out one square and well the top view and you lay down another, another square, do they have the same resistance? If you have a contact here, contact here, and run current through it, are you getting the same voltage drop? Like this. Do they have the same resistance? You're seeing, hmm? Why? Yeah, it's the same ratio, right? It's always one. So this is always one. And that, when this is one, Okay, when this is one, R becomes rho over T, right? And this is called the sheet resistance that you did, you used yesterday in the lab. It's called sheet resistance. I think the, because we are assuming we are doing the 500 nanometer technology for the fabrication of the chip, we're not going to fabricate it, but 
It's uh, based on the 500 nanometer technology or the C5 technology uh, from Global Foundry. And the, the sheet resistance right it provided, you, um, you don't have to create a number from somewhere. It's provided by the pro size, by the foundry. And I remember the number was 800 or 700 something ohms. 800 ohms, okay? So that's the sheet resistance, right? If you want to make a different, for example, it's 800. So this is 800 ohms, okay? If you need, for example, 2400 ohm resistor, what should you do? Right? Or mm -hmm. it's just a division, right? Ten K over eight hundred ohms will be what? whatever number here, 100 something, right? 160, did you say? 187? For example, if 187, what? No. 187, what? Squares. Is that correct? Each one is 800 ohms. And if you need a 2400 ohm resistor, you put three squares in series. I know you are not putting squares in series, but you just measure it, right? It's measure, depends on your width. You measure your length to make it three times of the width. Right? You must have a question. How do we pick up the width? I just give you an example. You can make it like this, or you can make it like this. There are both 2400 ohms resistors. So which one is better? Hmm? Yeah, first one is better and smaller because you don't, have, you don't have limited area on the chip to put on a second part. It's very expensive. Compared to a mansion. Square foot per <laughs> how much dollar per square feet, right? This is way more expensive than whatever house on this planet. So area, you want to make it smaller. So you want to uh, look at their data sheet of the pro size. What's the smallest width you can have on the chip, and then pick up that width, right? And then from there, design your length to make how many multiples of the width. Um, so this number is what? How many what? It's, yeah, 187 squares. Right? Because this is the resistance for each square. And you need 187 of these little squares to put in series to make up this 10K. Yeah. The resistors are also taking a lot of area on the chip. But slightly better than the capacitor, but still taking a lot of area. And you can you can basically create imagine that you grab a resistor from the lab, right? You can you can see the rod resistor with the color stripes on it, um, the bands on it, 1K, 10K resistors, and you can fabricate a 10K resistor. You, you, you measure it right? in, in your actual device after you lay it out. You just measure the dimension of it. You can find out it's amazing. So the, the raw resistor is the same resistance, but the, the one you laid out on Tuesday on the chip is probably only 10 micron, but still a 10K resist, uh, 10K ohms. Okay.
That makes sense? So we are answering, answering uh, we have answered the question. Um, we haven't answered any of the questions here, but, <laughs> but we will. <laughs> Um, okay, so now let's come back to N well. Why do we want to use N well as a resistor? Why not a P well? And why is a while? Because it looks like a while. Okay. Answer. Why well? Because it looks like a while. Why N? Why N well? Why not a P well? Yeah. That exactly. If you put a P type or P well, P style, uh, just a P type well instead of N type well, it's shorting that well to the P substrate. They're the same similar material, you are shorting them together, and it's not a semiconductor anymore, it's basically conducting current to it. And a lot of times you want to short your P-substrate to ground, and you are basically grounding your N well as well at the same time. So the resistor is not going to perform as a resistor anymore. It's, but both of the terminals are grounded in this case, which is bad. So before we get into the details of it, you have to talk about pin junctions in order to understand what's going on. So we have um, N-type and P-type. Then... We can form a diode, amazingly. So a diode, you have worked with diode in a lot of places, right? So you know a diode is able to conduct current in only one direction, you know, because the other direction is going to block it, ideally. There shouldn't be any current flowing that way. That's a diode, okay? And we can lay out a diode on the silicon wafer using the C5 technology. So a diode basically is just a P-type semiconductor and you put together with the N-type semiconductor. And that's it, that's the diode. You need a metal plate here to short it to a wire. So what's happening in the diode is if you put a P-type and N-type um, together because the n-type has actual holes in it right and the p-type has or the, uh, no the p-type has actual holes in it and the n-type has actual electrons in it if you put them together because of the concentration uh, difference the, the electrons is going to diffuse to the, to the other side and neutralize the holes and fill up the holes in here. The electron is going to move to that direction and the holes is going to move to this direction and to, to uh, neutralize the electrons. They are getting this. So what's happening is um, let me see. because the holes are being filled up by electrons right and the electrons are being uh, neutralized by the holes on this side and this area the entire area on both sides are both called the depletion region because the, the holes here is being depleted by, it's just being depleted because the electrons are moving to neutralize the holes. And same to here. So they are called a depletion region. Right? And if you apply a voltage to here, it's a, a higher potential on the left hand side and lower potential on the right hand side. 
what's going to happen is it's going to make the depletion region thinner. It's going to push it to the middle and make it thinner until it's thin enough. Right? And the electrons will be able to tunnel through this um, depletion region and form a, form a current flow. So it's going to flow this way because this is a higher potential. It's going to um, attract more uh, electrons to this side, but it has to be seen enough. So what's happening is when you apply the voltage, it's making, um, it's taking out electrons from um, the depletion region on this side and taking holes out from this depletion region on this side and making it thinner. So we'll look into the details later um, on, on Friday. But what's happening is when you, when you apply the voltage, the depletion region becomes thinner and eventually the current will be able to tunnel through the depletion region and reach the other side. And eventually you got a current flow that way because the electrons are going on the uh, going towards the, the opposite direction, reaching the anode of the power supply. So there will be a threshold over here, which is called the um, uh, building voltage. And this voltage has to overcome that building voltage in order to push the current through the diode. So for the ideal diode, when the voltage, so this is VI, right? You apply voltage to the, to the diode, this is VI. When the v, when VI is negative, it's not able to connect any current to it because the negative VI is giving a higher potential here and lower potential here, which is the diode is going to block it. But only when you have a positive VI, okay, it is able to conduct current. So ideally, it works like this. When VI is negative, nothing, no current. This is current. This is called uh, IV curve of the diode. When VI is negative, there's no current, ideally. But whenever it reaches uh, zero or it becomes higher, ideally it's going to draw infinite amount of current into the diode, ideally. But it's definitely not happening that way because we just talked about the building voltage in here. So the voltage here has to overcome that building voltage. You know, when you have holes in here, you have a plus. When you have electrons in here, you have a negative. So it's basically forming a little, it's not a power supply, but it's a building potential inside the pin junction. You got N, you got P, you got N put together as a pin junction. So it forms a little building potential within the pin junction. And in order to reverse it, right, in order to conduct current in here, I have to reverse this building voltage. Okay, and that building voltage in silicon is usually 0.7 volts. So in real case, in, in the real world, it has to be this. And this is 0.7 volts. That has to overcome that voltage in order to conduct current in the diode. And interestingly, the voltage potential, the voltage drop across the diode is going to be permanently 0.7 volts because of the building voltage. Okay, so now you know P and N here, and we'll talk more about the pin as uh, unweld and the CMOS transistors on Friday. Um, so we should do the quiz now, it's only like two, 10 minutes left. Any questions on this by far? I'm just trying to put too much stuff in one lecture.